When the word of the War Master was given, the Kagan had with him five full hordes of his legion upon the triumph fields of Ulanor. Records from the time are copious, not only from the personal recollections of the many Primarchs present, but uncountable tracts penned by remembrancers, the triumph being, of course, a massive political event for the Imperium. Few of these make much note of Jakatai's presence, however. Instead, focus is more often paid to those of his brothers more accustomed to or naturally inclined towards events of such pomp and circumstance. The Khan's appearances in historiography are nevertheless significant. When he does appear, he is almost always surrounded by a coterie of his legion's senior staff, and in the rare cases he was not, it was almost always in the company of one of two of his brothers, Horus or Magnus. The latter of these encounters are far less recorded, and indeed less public. They were quite private affairs. Suspicions of the Cyclops of Prospero were legendary, and though he wore them as a badge of honor, Magnus was canny enough to discuss important matters quite removed from the public eye. Bound to the Kagan by shared passions and outsider statuses, the Crimson King renewed his brotherhood with Jagatai on the fields of Ulanor. Wherever their legions paraded, they did so beside one another, and the two Primarchs were ever at each other's side. A thing that later, official art pieces commissioned of the Triumph sought to avoid association with. The Kagan held the Cyclops' honesty and scholarship in high esteem, and found that Magnus was one of the few brothers of his that treated the culture of Chogoris with respect. Their views did not always align. Far from it, their debates were lengthy, but the mutual respect between the two was ironclad. This extended to their legions. The Stormseers of the White Scars, so often maligned as barbarian shaman by the Imperium, were held in high esteem by the Magisters of the Thousand Sons. On the triumph fields of Ulanor, bonds were forged between the 5th and the 15th that few grandees of the Imperium cared to witness or record, the bonds whose import would matter deeply in the years to come. Horus was, naturally, the locus of attention for the Triumph, and had his attention divided a million separate ways. Nevertheless, he was sure to make time for his brother Jagatai, and publicly too, these were few, and it must be assumed that in one of them, or a session more private, the orders to cleanse the Chondak system were bestowed upon the fifth Primarch. The War Master was eager to speed the departure of his brother. The task that was set forth was, while time-sensitive, one that would still entail long years of combat. Horus granted Jagatai full authority to conduct his own muster. Those that the Khan brought forth to Chondak's would be soldiers he would personally select for the task ahead. By all accounts, it was a job that the Kagan set to with no small amount of vigor. It was quite likely that such planning was a welcome reprieve from the pomp and circumstance of the Triumph and its associated politicking. The marshalling of the Fifth Legion took several months Terran Standard, with the Kagan sending dispatches to his hordes distant across the galaxy. Several records imply heavily that Jagatai was quite reluctant to attach any non-Legion units to the campaign fleet. The bias of the White Scars for their own highly idiosyncratic means of war-making was quite clear. The most prominent non-Legion force attached were the Saturnine Rams Regiment of the Solar Auxilia. The cohort was fully mechanized, the better to keep pace with the highly mobile White Scars. The influence of Horus, however, is clear in two other additions to the muster. 8,000 militia of the 42nd Seraphine Guard, to be utilized in garrison duties, and quite curiously, 2,000 augmented siege engineers and attached war engines 
from the eighth fane of the Charonid Sentinels, whose ancient weaponry and devastation tactics were deeply at odds with the methods of warfare espoused by the Kagan and his legion. The most singularly curious addition, however, is a demi-vigil of the Silent Sisterhood, the Divisio Investigatis of the Adeptus Astra Telepathica. Sixty-three sisters militant, and one knight centura, Callistus Merovin, attach themselves to the Chondax muster at what must have been only the behest of the Kagan. The Sisterhood had taken part in the Ulanor campaign, but had only been utilized in pinpoint attacks on Orcoid psychers. Debate remains as to precisely why this curious formation was included. Several historians have pointed out that the Kagan was known to recruit advisors with extremely diverse backgrounds, skill sets, and opinions, ever in an effort to seek varying perspectives from his own to inform his judgment. It has also been noted that this entire demi-vigil was mounted upon ancient Terran pattern jet bikes, quite distinct from the Legion's own machines, ones which they were no doubt quite curious to observe the capabilities of. The muster, once completed, was a highly impressive collection of Imperial force at arms. Fleet-wise, the Legion's armada committed 472 capital ships, mainly of lighter classes, and approximately 600 destroyers and escorts. This was supplemented by 21 capital ships of the Armada Imperialis, with seven macro-hauler transports and 30 deep space scout ships. Finally, with one Optima Malefax light cruiser of the Silent Sisterhood. The 5th Legion committed approximately 67,600 white scars, as well as their attached armored units, representing 60 brotherhoods and around two-thirds of the Legion in its totality. Five hordes of the White Scars had been present at Ulanor, with the further three drawn out of campaigns around the Pale Stars, intending to arrive at Chondax via staging and resupply at the Forge World of Ryza. As Acolytes may be aware, the Fifth Legion followed no numerical schema for their organization. Instead, Hordes were marked only by the name of their current Noyan Khan, while Brotherhoods were named for their particular legacies. This format has proven no small headache to chroniclers past, especially given Shogorian customs of changing names upon ascension to legionary status. That being said, with a little diligence, history is certain upon the Hordes present at Chondax, being those of Krennic, Asudai, Orbitar, Gansuk, Sangjar, Nogai, Jemulin, and Nasik Noyan Khans. Few preparations were ultimately needed to get this host underway. The White Scars were rightly famed for their strategic mobility. The hordes present at Ulanor had remained at combat stations throughout the duration of the Triumph, using every second they were spared from parading to resupply, repair, and rearm. Several brotherhoods, it was reported, eschewed the formalities entirely, chasing Xenos remnants out-system in the Legion's fastest pursuit vessels. Even as the Saturnine Rams and Charonid Sentinels were mustering their forces, several scout companies had already departed Ulanor to scout the Chondax volume and the warp channels leading to its approach. This was rapidly escalated to the deployment to Chondax of two full hordes and several warship squadrons, intended to secure for the Legion an outer staging ground. Atypically, the Kagan did not accompany this vanguard, choosing instead to remain at Ulanor, spending what time he could with Horus and Magnus. Despite, however, the speed of their deployment, the White Scars were not the first Imperial forces present in Chondax by any means. The Alpha Legion, at the behest of the War Master, had arrived in system quite some time ago, and had been preparing the volume for the arrival of their cousins. Several void stations had been constructed around the system's heliopause, the limits of the star's solar winds, and several more stations had been built yet further out, in interstellar space itself. 
these so-called tenebrae stations, by Alpha Legion parlance, were shrouded constructions filled with communication systems of the most complex variety, designed for signal interception and redirection. The web they created around the volume effectively blocked all incoming communications and could easily baffle and redirect anything that was attempting to move outwards. According to the unbalanced scales, there were also present aboard several certain cabals of Astartes from the Word Bearers Legion, attached to the 20th for their ability to manipulate the psychic communions of astropaths. The Alpha Legion's efforts were not confined to the construction of the Tenebrae stations alone, however. Several worlds within the Chondax volume were being actively prepared for the arrival of the White Scars. A sprawling system with three stars, Chondax had been first charted by rogue trader flotillas over a century before. It had, at some point in the distant past, been colonized by humans from the Terran Scandic realms. Although these colonies had devolved into Reaver outposts during the Age of Strife, and had been utterly swept aside when the now demolished Orcoid Empire had taken the sector. The Orcs, per the Khan's orders from Horus, were still present and in significant numbers, but lacked a uniting leadership that they had once possessed under the deposed Urlak Urg. These remnants the Alpha Legion were now thoroughly documenting, with headhunter teams reconnoitering major Orcish holdfasts at Hate Spike and Vorscar in the Inner System, Black Blight in the Mid System, and several notable nomadic Voidborn Orc clans in the Outer System's asteroid belts. Not intending to engage or disrupt the Xenos in the slightest, the Alpha Legion established dozens of small, shielded and cloaked readouts across the volume, many intended to shelter at most two dozen Astartes at any given time. At least two of these, however, were exceptions, as the 20th Legion constructed major installations on the planet Bifurst and the moons of Phemus. As with the Tenebrae stations, communications equipment was entrenched within these facilities, alongside augury webs of highest sensitivity, thus granting the Alpha Legion eyes and ears over the entire star system, the better to track and manipulate any and all fighting within the volume. Despite the accounts contained within the unbalanced scales, the exact scale of the Alpha Legion's contingent at Chondax will remain difficult to ascertain. Neither the scales, nor Imperial historiography and data looms, corroborate with eyewitness accounts and combat records of the White Scars, although one must note that even the accounts of the Fifth Legion are themselves occasionally contradictory. Sometimes, given the nature of Chogorian oral tradition, and sometimes given the nature of the foe they were engaged with. Considering, as always, this is the Alpha Legion we are talking about, this confusion is the base point of the matter. As such, your most humble servant will simply recount the full comportment of the 20th Legion's forces as recorded by all sources. Concerning the Alpha Legion's fleet, one must note that the Armada of the 20th was deployed in theatres across the full scope of the galaxy in the early years of the Horus Heresy, and always did so in a position of numerical superiority. Whatever the Alpha Legion had reported to the Divisio Militaris as their fleet strength was a total fabrication. In reality, whatever official number was given is likely to have been three times as much. Over the course of the Chondax campaign, two distinct varieties of Alpha Legion craft were noted. The first were squadrons of fast destroyer vessels outfitted for pursuit and interdiction operations. Numbering an estimated 100 ships, over the years of the campaign, these squadrons intercepted any and all craft inbound to the system and destroyed them. It has latterly been confirmed that they were responsible for the destruction of four Imperial cargo arcs, a dozen Chartist merchant vessels, and even a single frigate from the 15th Legion Thousand Sons, which had escaped destruction at Prospero and was desperately seeking sanctuary within their brothers in the White Scars. 
The second deployment of Alpha Legion ships was at a fleet level scale, numbering some 600 capital ships and over a thousand escorts. This armada was intended, according to the unbidden scales, to be a tool of last resort, but is important to note as the first major deviation the 20th Legion took from Horus's original orders. It was, quite obviously, mustered as a tool to engage and destroy the White Scars in open void combat, something the War Master had expressly forbidden Alpharius from doing. It is not believed this fleet was on station at Chondax until 006 M31, some five years into the campaign, and was placed at anchor in the neighboring Angvor system, shrouded from 5th Legion long-range scanning by the same sensor webs employed in the Tenebrae stations. Accounts from the White Scars that saw many of the vessels stress that they were not proper combat craft in large part. Rather, many were converted bulk haulers, outfitted with minimal armaments, but well disguised enough to register as battleships or cruisers on auguries. Many other ships in use by the Alpha Legion, subsequently destroyed in combat and analyzed, have been definitively identified as craft originally belonging to other legions, both those considered loyalist and laterally traitor, ones listed as missing long before the outbreak of the Horus Heresy, clearly clandestinely taken by the 20th and turned towards ends far more nefarious. Compared to their fleet elements, the actual ground forces of the Alpha Legion present at Chondax were relatively small. Based on accounts of the few actual ground-based engagements between the two legions, and material held within the unbalanced scales, it is highly unlikely that the amount of Astartes committed by the 20th to Chondax ever exceeded 30,000. Its strength was divided into small, mobile strike forces, each of which was tasked with monitoring and engaging a specific section of the system's volume. This being said, the largest installations on Femus and Bifurst likely held far larger garrisons, given their primacy and sensitivity. Precisely who was commanding these elements, and the fleet, remains unknown to this day. Several White Scars accounts have stressed that Alpharius himself was present within the system, but these are noted by historitors to contradict themselves, seemingly placing the 20th Primarch in several different locations at any given time. Given how the Alpha Legion were known to have operated in this period, it is highly unlikely that Alpharius Omegon ever engaged in combat, and if he had, it is likewise unlikely that he would have been recognized as doing so. One must assume that any individual the White Scars identified as Alpharius was a decoy, an intimidation tactic on behalf of the 20th Legion. The only other insight at this juncture is that of the unbalanced scales, dubious at best, which refers to the commander of the Alpha Legion at Chondax only by the pseudonym Desidero, something that may be anything between an affectation or an internal Legion cipher. One is not aware of this individual or codename appearing in any other volume the 20th Legion were engaged in. Your most humble servant must ultimately assume that it is a cipher under which the Legion's campaign Harrowmaster chose to conduct himself. As the 20th Legion labored in spinning their web, the 5th continued to make rapid progress in its journey towards Chondax, with the Kagan having finally departed Ulanor and now concerning himself with forward strategic planning during the crossing. Chondax presented a challenge. It was no simple compliance operation, which typically focused on the conquest of one inhabited world, or perhaps several. The system contained 16 major target worlds, all of which were known to host significant Xenos elements, as well as hundreds of smaller targets and potential bolt holes for the orcs. Of all the alien strains encountered by mankind, the orc had proven the most resilient to annihilation. If any trace of the Xenos remained, they would flourish anew. The Chondax campaign would be a long one. This the Kagan could see quite clearly. Despite the size and speed of the White Scar's fleet, 
he could not interdict every single orc vessel in system. Any attacks his legion mounted must be done with coordination, speed, and ferocity. The foe must be wholly exterminated, denied any hope of retreat, else the White Scars would find themselves chasing orcs around the stars for eternity. The initial move would be to seize a single world in system, a central hub from where the remainder of the purge could be conducted. From that base of operations, targets could be tracked, identified, and marked for extermination. The plan, of course, relied heavily on the White Scar's decentralized command structure and highly independent nature. Each of the Brotherhoods would need to rapidly pivot to new deployments and missions with little warning and maximum efficacy. The Imperial Army detachments would form a strategic reserve. To them would fall the more static warfare operations the Scars could not comfortably conduct, or garrison duties that would be wasted upon Astartes. The Kagan selected the world of Kvarsir as his target of opportunity, a large planetary mass consisting of wide, open salt plains. Designated heretofore as Chondak's Prime, and known informally amongst the Legion as the White World, it was ideal for the Fifth Legion's intended purposes. Of all of the isolated, dangerous worlds of the Chondak system, it was perhaps the least terrible in habitation terms, its pristine white plains and hardy scrub flora ideal for the warfare the White Scars preferred. It was centrally located, within a reasonable sublight distance from the remaining major targets of the sprawling volume. This was considered important, as the Legion's intending astropaths had noted increased warp turbulence in the region, and thus warned against any unnecessary short-range warp jumps being undertaken. Lastly, and perhaps most curiously to those unfamiliar with the characters of the White Scars and their Primarch, it was a site of greatest concentration of Xenos forces yet assessed by those scout craft already assaying the system, occupying, as the orcs did, numerous strongholds in both the Salt Plains and the more remote northern mountain reaches. The Kagan aimed to descend upon the foe utterly unexpected, shattering their strength before they could rally for a fight, and leaving his legion to hunt down the remaining fleeing elements at leisure. It would be a good fight, and a satisfying aftermath. The mood certainly called for it. Personal journals of the White Scars, and oaths of the moment sworn in their commitment to the campaign, spoke of a legion quite ready to leave behind the demands of the parade and ceremonial duty, and to blood themselves upon an enemy that needed killing. The Scars and their Khan may have been essentially committing themselves to exile, but to all the world they thought it good and just. Transiting through one of the lesser spinward channels of the great Paramar Warp Canal, the so-called Passage of Iron that crossed through the Maelstrom and ended at the Mechanicum Domain of Anvilus, the Chondax fleet translated into the volume after only a few short months of travel. Jagatai Khan had instructed his navigators to breach real space within the maximal arrangement of the system's Mandeville Belt, a starkly narrow area of space between the orbits of the central binary stars' gravitational field and that of the third, outer star. Essentially, the exit point was pierced in a location that placed the scars, in astrographic terms, right atop their target world, utterly bypassing the orcs that infested the outer belts and allowing the Legion to strike the Xenos with no warning whatsoever. The combined firepower of the Imperial Armada utterly swept aside what few ramshackle orcoid craft and stations were in orbit around Chondak's Prime, securing the orbital volume with ease. The only reported casualty was a light cruiser forsworn of the Imperial Navy, struck as it was by an orc ship and overwhelmed with Xenos borders. Despite Legion troops rushing to its aid, the Xenos breached the engineerium of the vessel, detonating its reactor in suicidal destruction and tearing the vessel apart. It was, however, an opportunity for the Kagan's famous opportunism to shine. As debris from the Forsworn began to plunge into fiery ruin in the planet's atmosphere, the Khan 
ordered the deployment of the Legion to follow it. Despite the phenomenal risk to landing craft, Jagatai trusted the skills of his pilots, and the maneuver paid off entirely. Hugging as close as they dared to burning metal meteorites, White Scar Stormbird and Thunderhawk gunships were entirely shielded from orcoid eyes, and thus return fire. The Legion's initial target was the Orc Fortress of Black Blight, an ancient human holdfast seized by the Xenos in their capture of the planet and turned into one of their rusting, dilapidated citadels. Against this abomination, the Kagan unleashed the Karash, the so-called Ebon Keshig, one of the Legion's few contingents that took to the battlefield in heavy Terminator armor. The formation was a curious one. Its ranks were not fixed, instead made up of an ever-changing roster of volunteers whose motivations for serving were wholly their own. Many sought to make names for themselves serving in such a dangerous frontline unit, while others opted to serve as a means of penance, to gain absolution for some failure, perceived or real. Several Remembrancers, having observed the Ebon Keshig, had dubbed the formation a suicide unit. To one's mind, this is quite typical of the reductionist view of Imperial society for the White Scars. Ever a legion whose traditions defied easy categorization, the Ebon Keshig was a unit, membership of which was an honor as much as it was a punishment. To their brothers, the Karash undertook a deeply necessary role, but one that few White Scars could bring themselves to fulfill. To sacrifice the speed and freedom of a jet bike for the lumbering confines of Terminator Plate was anathema to many. So, while membership of the Ebon Keshig may be the result of a dishonor in battle, it was nevertheless an honor to undertake something your brethren could not. The Karash performed their role in the capture of Black Blight admirably. Within the twists and turns of the fortress, the Terminators moved in a deadly hit-and-run dance with the Orcs, demolishing key defensive positions before fading back as the Xenos mustered themselves. Their armor protected them from most any weaponry that the Orcs could throw at them, and over the space of several hours, a mere 1,000 Astartes brought death and destruction to several hundred thousand orcs. Outside the fortress walls, the Charonid sentinels were deployed to bring them crashing down. With the orcs within enraged, chasing the ghosts of the Ebon Keshig, the grim warriors of Sol's cold outer spheres encountered little resistance, lacing the walls with melter charges and other more obscure weaponry only their most senior officers appeared to be permitted to use. In sequence, the siege weaponry sheared away massive pieces of Black Blight's outer defenses, opening its heart to the hordes of the Kagan. Tired of chasing a foe around the maze of their own making, the orcs poured out onto the plains, baited straight into the ground the White Scars knew best. Squadrons of scimitar jet bikes fell upon the orcoid host with joyful abandon, the Ordu of Jagatai loosed upon the foes of mankind at last. At the head of the host was the Khan of Khans himself, a summer storm of death, laying ruinous waste to the hapless Xenos. The Battle of Black Blight took less than six hours to decisively conclude in the White Scar's favor. The remaining orcs, as expected, fled outwards into the vast salt plains to link up with the uncountable masses of their vile kin. This the Kagan had accounted for. The orc, when cornered, was a truly vicious creature. The Primarch had no intention to risk the lives of his sons in penning the beasts in. Quite the opposite. He was counting on word of the Astartes' arrival to spread from the survivors to the various warbands, and for those warbands to mobilize for war. Thus the Scars would engage them, upon the open ground atop saddle. Black Blight was raised flat by the Charonid Sentinels, lest the orcs somehow recapture and squat within its ruin. In its place was now a White Scar's encampment. No citadel, but a war camp that could, at short notice, relocate anywhere it needed to. From here, the hordes of the Fifth Legion rode out across the salt. War would be brought to the orcs, 
and it would come to the sound of laughing white scars. Ave Imperator. Gloria in excelsis terra. This video and this channel were made possible thanks to the very kind donations and support from my Patreon subscribers. If you'd like to help support the channel, head on over to patreon.com slash Oculus Imperia. If you'd like to receive more updates about the channel and any future videos, you can contact me or follow me on Twitter at Oculus Imperia. Otherwise, please like, subscribe, comment, let me know your feedback, and as ever, thank you very much for watching.